So in the last video, we talked about the three patterns of population growth that exist in populations. That very rarely you will see in life the idea of linear growth, that in every generation, one more or equal value of people are going to be added. In fact, what you usually see would be something like an exponential growth, where life tends to explode. But that's only going to happen if there's unlimited resources. But since in life there's always limited resources, the growth that starts slow in the beginning, because there's very few people around, so it's hard to find mates and all of that stuff, it will pick up speed and grow very, very fast. But then, as you start approaching the, the carrying capacity, K, which stands for the maximum number of people that can live in the population, this is going to cause the population growth to actually slow down. So linear growth is when you add a constant number in every generation. Exponential growth is when you multiply the current numbers by a constant factor with each generation. And then logistic growth is when you take in consideration the fact that, that populations can't grow either way, linear or exponential like that because eventually they will hit a limit to what they can actually uh, support by the ecosystem which is called the carrying capacity. But what is this idea of the carrying capacity? Well, it's the idea that for you to have a certain number of population, it depends on the annual production or the number of productivity that exists in the population. But it also depends on other things that will make people die off. like. Uh, hunting, population losses because of death, such as starvation, disease, predators, old age, habitat destruction, pollution, accidents. Lots of things can happen that can kill people or cause the death rate to increase. Meanwhile, production could cause the birth rate to increase. And the balance between the two of them will determine what is called the carrying capacity, literally how many can actually fit in the population. And the moment that you go over the carrying capacity, the population can no longer be sustained and you start seeing people being lost because of that. So I like this graph because it's kind of showing you this idea. So in this video, we're going to talk about that, about how populations will, will grow from that beginning. Uh, it will increase more and more, but things like starvation, parasites, diseases, accidents, uh, weather phenomena, hunting, predators, and all of the other things can actually affect how many people can live in the population and, and, and effectively reduce the carrying capacity that you had in that. So I want you to understand that this concept of carrying capacity is not a static number, all right? It's not like, you know, the carrying capacity of the world is, is X. It's not like that. This number fluctuates as the ecosystem changes. If there is more disease, that's going to change things. If there is more, is more inclement weather, it's going to change things. If predation increases, it's going to change things. If there's less resources, it's going to change things. So you sometimes see in nature what is called a seasonal pattern of growth, where during some months of the year, it's easier for animals to actually have children and grow, and so you're going to see the surplus of the population growing. But then as the months go by and maybe winter comes by and the resources are depleted, only a few of the members of the species will survive again. But then they will restart the cycle the following year and so forth. So I need you to understand that populations carrying capacity can change throughout the seasons or throughout time. And that's why it's to study population growth and decline, it's a, it's a constant fluctuating density study, right? It's not something that's stuck in time. By the way, this means that, say, for example, you wanted to get rid of a pest or an invasion of mice on your backyard or someplace like that, the easiest way to get rid of them is to do something to lower their carrying capacity. So take out the nutrients or uh, put a predator that's, that's going to attack them. But the best way to destroy them is to lower their carrying capacity. And, and the best way to do that is actually to lower the productivity of whatever is actually feeding them so that they will have more uh, death instead of more, more life. Now, although there's lots of limiting factors which I'm about to talk about, the thing that limits population growth the most is actually the food that they have to eat. So that's the one thing you should do if you're trying to get rid of them. You can always introduce a predator, you can always uh, put something that will kill them like disease or poison, but ultimately lowering their food resources is going to be the most limiting thing that's going to cause them to die. Now there's also other limiting factors and let's talk about these things. Now, what are the things that limit population growth? Well, the most obvious one is going to be what we call the density-dependent factors. Now, these are things that depend on the number of people who are living in the ecosystem. All right? So I know it's kind of like a crazy name, but it's, it just sounds uh, like a lot, but it's actually easy to understand. Density-dependent factors are things that limit the population growth but depend on how many people are living there. So let's learn this through examples. The first time type of density-dependent factor is competition or territoriality. 
Think about it this way. If you have a lot of predators living in a certain place, the competition for prey is going to increase. And that's going to decrease the number of people who can actually live in the population because you're going to have to fight for resources and actually waste energy fighting for resources. So, Likewise, the herbivores, which are predating on the grass, if there's too many in the herd, they're going to have to compete for the best grass. And that in itself is going to limit the population. So that is an example of a density dependent factor or the idea that the number of people living there is going to determine how much competition there is and therefore how many people can possibly survive. So it's like a little cycle. Another example is predation. All right, it, Predation clearly depends on numbers because if you have a lot of organisms living in the ecosystem, the predator can eat more. right? And if there's less numbers in the ecosystem, the predator can eat less. But think about uh, this also. Is it easier for a predator to, to, to spot a large herd or is it easier for it to spot a herd that a bunch of animals which are spread out uniformly to the ecosystem? Clearly, the herd is easier to spot. But it's also for the herd members uh, more likely that they're going to be the ones to escape since if you have a large number of organisms, it's going to be very, very hard for you to be the one that's actually the one that get, gets caught. So organisms have two different strategies. They can hide from predators or they can be like, hey, I'm right here except there's a thousand of me and the chances of you catching me among this thousand is very slow so it's like you hiding in a large number of people but that means then that predation and praise being the relationship between the two of them also depends on numbers likewise for example predators will sometimes hunt in packs as opposed to hunting by themselves and so you see that this, these strategies for survival are also density dependent. Predation is density dependent because the, if you learn in large numbers, you're going to be less likely to be the one caught, but more likely to be actually seen. And if you're in small numbers, very sparse from you, you're going to be more likely to be caught if you're actually seen. But you're also less likely to be seen because you you can hide better away from other from other other people. Like a chameleon, which is uh, has a strategy to hiding, he's not going to form a herd because that's like counterintuitive. He, his strategy is to hide, so he avoids others of his kind because he wants to hide and he doesn't want to be noticed. But a herd that can't hide as well, they tend to actually stick together and get the numbers, uh, the power that they have in numbers. The same thing is true on the other side, on the predator side. If you you have to deal with the fact that if you hunt in a pack, you're probably going to get less food than you would if you hunted by yourself. But hunting in a pack, you may be more likely to actually uh, get the prey. So the balance between these things is what determines the, 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 the intrinsicity of the population. But it, clearly, it has to do with numbers. So again, it's density dependent. Another example of density dependent factor is the idea of parasitism or disease or waste accumulation or toxins. The more people you have living in a certain place, the faster toxins will accumulate. Just think of a herd of animals in a wild, all right, and think of how much feces they much, must drop as the herd goes by. You know, they say that that's how you can tell that a herd of cows has been there because you can see all the manure that they left behind. You know, the grass is gone and the manure stays behind. So that's a better example of what I'm talking about here. The accumulation of waste is going to go faster and the accumulation of toxins will go faster. Likewise, if one animal gets sick and every animal is living close to that animal, chances are the disease will spread faster if the people were separated from each other. For example, in modern human society, diseases tend to spread faster than they did before because before it took a long time for people to go from one place to the other and populations were pretty isolated. But nowadays with globalization, air travel and all these kinds of things, diseases can spread a lot faster because we are actually communicating and moving around much faster. And so our population is more closely connected. So that increases the amount of disease. Likewise, parasites. Parasites can spread from host to host a lot faster if you're, if you're actually living closer to each other. Think of a city, for example. A city has to deal with these problems. Uh, pollution, waste, toxicity, disease, parasites. All these are things that a large city will be more common in a large city than they will be in a country setting. The last thing that has to do with population density is something that we call intrinsic factors. Now, some organisms actually notice that their numbers are very high. And in those cases, they actually shut down the reproductive processes through hormonal control. For example, when the mice population gets really high, sometimes they know that the competition is increasing so much 
that they are going to fight for those resources, fight for the niche, fight for the place of the environment, fight for 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 for, uh, for their prey, for whatever they're eating. They're going to be fighting for mates, and it, it gets so much fighting that it's actually detrimental to the, to the population. They start to die off because of that. So that causes their internal bodies to actually shut down the the, the reproductive processes. So hormones control will actually stop the animals from engaging in reproductive activities which will actually then also decrease the numbers of people in the population so you see all of these things are density dependent factors competition for resources for niche for for prey and for mates all will limit the population size predation has to do with numbers both in terms of being caught and in catching the prey has to do with how many you hunt with or how many you gather with so and also parasitism disease toxicity and intrinsic factors all have to do with the number of organisms living in that area but sometimes populations numbers go down and it has nothing to do with how many people are living in that place sometimes it's independent of the number of people living in the place let me give an example when humans come to a place and destroy the habitat it doesn't matter if there was 10 people living in it or a million people living in it everybody dies because there's no more habitat left so natural disasters are also the same thing a forest fire a flood an earthquake a storm these things will kill animals no matter how many animals are living in that place so it's independent of the actual number of organisms like it's not the same thing as competition where it obviously depends on how many were living around it just will kill people indiscriminately because it will destroy the habitat. Remember we talked about in the ecosystems lecture series that the habitat destruction was the most surefire way to destroy biodiversity. And this is what we're talking about here. Natural disasters and human habitat destruction will level the numbers no matter how many live there. It could be one, it could be ten, it could be a million. Destroying the habitat will kill everybody. So that's an example of another limiting factor which is density independent. So I hope that's clear for you guys and on the next video we're going to talk about population dynamics or how populations grow and decrease throughout time. See you guys then.